Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Len Jacklin, you have five minutes to speak now, or do you wish to speak now or to reserve your right to speak till later? I reserve my right to speak till later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jacklin. Uh, I'll now open uh, the debate on the amendment. Uh, Say something, Councillor Jacklin, no? No, no, I was replying to it. Ah, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank, thanks for your help. I call on Councillor Bond. Councillor and Hill, Cabinet members, divisional directors, and our financial staff have faced enormous problems in setting this budget. They've had to thread their way through complex and often competing spending demands on the one hand and the absolute certainty of income reductions on the other. They have resisted with courage any temptation of raiding the reserves, reserves that will almost certainly be needed in the years ahead, where they will be a godsend, but where their absence will be a calamity for the Council, and even worse, a calamity for the people of Suffolk. If I leave you with only one thought today, it is this. A reserve is not an income. It does not replace itself. And this wretched amendment <laughs> represents <laughs> the worst in Labour thinking, if I can call it that. <laughs> the worst in cheap political posturing. How dare they insinuate that children's education in this county is being put at risk when this is not the case. And when in any, in any event, the one single factor that really counts is the quality of the teaching. The Labour group will never understand that the budget is not a short-term short political game, but a matter of arithmetic. A good budget, like this one, sets out not only a financial blueprint for the coming financial year, but makes prudent provision for the risks in the future. And the future, Mr Chairman, is going to be raw. It is going to be raw because the government is spending more than it gets. The world as a whole will not allow the British government to continue in this way forever. The Labour Party can live in fairyland if it wants to. And perhaps in this sense I should criticise this pitiful effort as having not gone far enough. Why not free ice creams for the over 75s like me? Why not? There is money in the reserves. Let's spend it. When it's gone, it's gone. But we live, though, do we not, in a real and harsh world, a world in which we must live within our means, with something put by for a rainy day, as every Suffolk housewife knows, and which the Labour Party will never learn. This council, this council provides a vast range of services to the public. It supports the sick, the vulnerable, the needy. It supports the children and young people. It does so with compassion and conviction, but also wisely, with financial prudence and discipline. A strange word for some, I know, and with a weather eye open for choppy waters ahead. I say, Councillor Anne Hill, and, her, uh, and her, our senior officers have done an excellent job in very difficult circumstances. They do not deserve to be sniped at in this sanctimonious way. They deserve, they deserve to be thanked very much. This mischievous amendment should be rejected and their budget should be supported by all in this chamber today. Thank you.
Thank, uh, thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Murray. <laughs> Follow that. <laughs> Councillor Bond. Mr Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, councillors, reductions to services, no. Changing the services for the better, most certainly yes. Saving money where reasonably possible, if we possibly can. Care perching for the elderly, learning and the physical disabilities group, we're spending £150 million a year. Reablement services, £25 million a year. Carer support, £2.5 million a year. Our service in ACS is essentially the contact and the relationships made by our frontline staff. And this then enables a client, or their carer or family, to achieve a positive outcome to a health, mental health or social situation, whether they are elderly, have a learning or physical disability, by intervening early in a situation, using community resources where possible, or implementing short-term effective reablement and preventative intervention to avoid or supplement after the event a necessary hospital admission. Our frontline staff work to keep people where they want to be, at home, and keeping residential home demand down. There is firm evidence that supporting lives, connecting communities, is working both functionally and financially. We are meeting demand with current resources, working more effectively and efficiently. We do use reserves in ACS frugally to smooth out peaks and troughs of demand and outlay, to provide the buffer whilst implementing change and transformation in the provision of things like care homes and the balance between care home admission and the sometimes more expensive but preferable option of supporting people to live in their homes. Staff training and development, of course, is vitally important for both staff advancement and retention. But should we just be doing more of the same? Should we not be working with our partners to achieve economies of scale and hence savings in a million pound budget? I say plainly we should. Housing related support, a non statutory but nonetheless key part in supporting both communities and the vulnerable. We have approximately 350 usually block contracted schemes with a vast variety of organisations producing a range of services, largely bricks and mortar based, at a wide range of unit cost and occupancy to enable suitable accommodation for things like, uh, people like care leavers, marginalised adults, young families, people experiencing domestic abuse and support services for sheltered accommodation, to name but just a few. Where the providers themselves tell us they can do things better and save money, should we not do this? Are we content with low occupancy rates, yet paying 100% under the block contract? Of course not. We must constantly strive for more effective use of the Suffolk Pound. Should we not look at outcomes and moving people on to better things? A driver is needed for change where necessary. More of the same is not an effective option. We need to closely and repeatedly examine the commissioning cycle, look at how needs change, decide on desired and realistic outcomes, plan the change to produce those outcomes, and then shape the market to deliver that change, and then start the cycle and reassess again. Now, the integration of health and social care is vital to provide more effective and early intervention. Now, the effects and events induced by both the Health and Social Care Act 2012 and the Care Act 2014 have still to evolve in full, and they put more incompletely costed statutory duties on adult care in terms of eligibility, but we don't plan any rise in eligibility. Carers' support, prison services, advocacy, all of these have to be financed, so we need to be prudent. The new deprivation of liberty case law is, for instance, necessitating an increase in specialist staff assessments. Our planned capital budget includes a very significant IT investment to further enable the front line to work increasingly closely with health, children's services, safeguarding and our other partners. There is no need for freezing homes. Councillor Martin, warm heart. We have a successful warm homes, healthy people scheme with our partners 
in recent times. 2,400 surveys of houses, 850 <coughs> extra fuel payments, 1,300 insulation referrals, 134 grants for heating to be refixed. The eligibility for that, people over 60, people with children under 5, incomes of under £17,000 and savings below 5000 A very helpful scheme which is working. So, central government, I agree, of whatever colour is unlikely to face up to the chronic national underfunding estimated in health to be about £8 billion between now and 2020, and for the same period about £4.3 billion in social care. And so we have no alternative but to carefully husband our resources to contain the demand with our demographic changes. So, paraphrasing Ed Balls when he said last week, will somebody... I amend this to, will somebody pay? Will anybody pay? Well, the answer is no. We must live within our budget, and I commend this budget to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Murray. When, when we, um, if you hear a little bell go, it won't be to evacuate the building. It will be to let you know you've half a minute before your time comes to an end. Thank you. We'll move on to our next speaker, Councillor Stamp. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I still feel slightly unsettled at the prospect of a Labour government, as Councillor Martin reminded us it might happen. Um, I don't know about Suffolk housewives. I won't mention those. But I will mention Margaret Thatcher, a very strong lady, who said, who said the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. So our reserves are a good example here. Once they're gone, they are gone. We cannot simply keep using them to prop up services, as you're suggesting, opposite. I'm not very good with figures, Chairman, but this year our provisional settlement from the government, I believe, is one, sorry, 182.7 million. This is 27.7 million down from last year. Our cost pressures are rising. Even to my fairly basic brain, that means we have less money to spend than we did significantly. That means we have to stop and carefully look at everything we do and start to deliver services very, very differently, spending less where we can while still protecting the vulnerable. I'm proud of this council's record where this is concerned. Look at libraries. It's a great example of how a completely different model can actually improve a service. Yeah, yeah. Working with partners such as the vol voluntary sector. That works. Working with partners works, strangely enough. I'm a firm believer if we always do what we've always done, we will always get what we have always got. The economic has changed and so must we. We need to react as we have been doing and think and do things differently. Spending money we don't have it's not an intelligent strategy. It's actually a recipe for disaster. We are still investing where we need to. Five million in adult social care IT to ensure that social workers uh, can communicate effectively. An Eastern Relief Road in Bury, the Beckles Relief Road, Lowestoft Third Rising, educational improvements, the list goes on. Mr Chairman, colleagues, I'm extremely happy to support this budget. Councillor Matthew Hicks, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure all of us in this chamber can remember back to this time last year when we had a proposed budget presented to us by the opposition that was clearly drawn up on nothing but the back of a cigarette packet with poorly thought out ideas. This year, we have a different approach. We have a four page amendment, but I'm afraid it is still very poorly considered. In fact, I would go as far as to say it is ill conceived and ill thought out. The CYP directorate, along with others, are having to live in very difficult times. And this, we must all remember, is due to the tragic legacy of that old friend who declared the end of boom and bust. Where we are still paying in 2015 for the last Labour government's financial mismanagement, and we must not forget that. When looking at CYP, I believe our budget shows that we, on this side of the chamber, are fully committed to helping achieve the, children's, sorry, the Suffolk Children's Trust vision for children and young people. This is to enable all children and young people in Suffolk to aspire to and achieve their full potential, giving them the basis for a successful life as active members of their community. The arrangements for the education and learning team absolutely deserve our full support, and I am confident these changes will increase the pace of change. 
The Improvement Service now has a presence in 99.7% of all schools via a single point of contact, re-establishing its relationship with all schools in the county. This closer working relationship is nothing but a good thing. I've also looked at making every intervention count transformation plans and how the teams will work within the signs of safety practice framework being implemented in Suffolk. This has already had a positive impact on the number of cases held and the number of children requiring a child protection plan. To ensure the savings described can be achieved, a number of enabling programmes have been identified, including the development of an IT infrastructure to enable a more mobile, flexible and efficient way of working. There will be enhanced information, advice and guidance to families, communities, partners to self-help and resolve more issues locally. This is absolutely integral to the strategy to build a more resilient families and communities and includes working with the voluntary and community sectors to develop local networks. This side of the chamber is absolutely committed to making sure the services we provide to the ones that most value it and need it are delivered in such a way that makes, every, sorry, makes very good use of every pound spent. This side of the chamber understands that nothing can be achieved without sound financial management, which is why we have made it our hallmark. It is because of this fundamental difference in policy of a careful managing of budgets versus the spend, borrow, bust, spend, borrow, bust philosophy of the opposition that is in essence before us again today. We must listen to the residents of Suffolk who want services run more efficiently, with a tightened budget and do not want council tax increases on the scale of the past. I'm only going to mention 18% once, just for you, <laughs> Councillor Jacklin. <laughs> this idea of raiding reserves is quite simply reckless, and we must always live within our means. I appreciate it is unnatural to the opposition, and it is clearly visible, as I said, from the historic council tax increases. But prudent, prudent financial management is the key. Mr Chairman, today's amendment reflects clearly that the notion of sensible and prudent is something far from the minds of the opposition, and I will certainly ask everyone to reject the ill-conceived, ill-thought-out, and in my view, illogical amendment before us today. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Fellow councillors, for me, this is a responsible budget for the times we are in. Um, this budget, presented by Councillor Antill and the finance team, hasn't appeared in the last week. It has been debated and reviewed over the last six months. Indeed, this actually was scrutinised for a whole day for those on the scrutiny committee, and we made a number of recommendations, as Councillor Martin has referred to one or two of them. I point out to this chamber that, in fact, the amendments have had no scrutiny whatsoever. Um, recommendations from that scrutiny committee were given to the directorates, and I acknowledge and thank uh, Councillor Anto and her team for the response which is included in your budget book. Like many of my colleagues, I particularly support this budget, not least because it recognises the real times we face. As will not be a surprise to the Director of Adult Community Services and our Cabinet Member for ACS, I particularly support the importance of investing to save, investing to save in our most costly service. It represents 40% of our revenue budget, and that is a big challenge. And with demographic increases, that's an even bigger one. So I am particularly pleased to see, as has half been mentioned already, of the 8.5 million which has been invested in capital to provide the digitisation and the technical support to that team. I, I emphasise, fellow councillors, the amendment has not been scrutinised at all. I therefore commend this council to support an unamended budget. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, fellow councillors, I think we can all agree uh, with Councillor Antill that
that the resource man management team here in the Council is able and well led. I think we can all agree it can be relied upon to provide an accurate assessment of the budget cha challenges we face against the backdrop of the current government's deficit reduction programme. Councillors, I draw your attention to page 31 of our agenda. It shows a graph that shows not only the challenge for the next three years, but the following two. That amount gives a budget shortfall of 160 million. So, Councillor Martin, using 12 million pounds a year of our reserves gets you to the end of that. It leaves a net 80 million. Well, well I'm sorry you don't understand all of this, and I'm sorry you're confused. As Councillor Finch has said, you've had plenty of time to think about this and to ask questions. Ask away. I'm sure the opportunity will be after this if it remains the case. Now, while the next Conservative Government aims to run a, a budget surplus uh, and eliminate that uh, by 2018-19, the Labour Party, should it ever make it to power, is pledging a surplus by the end of the next Parliament, 2020. That's just two years later. Barely any difference whatsoever. I want to emphasise something that Councillor Antill has said. Nowhere in the Labour Party's reduction plan is there absolution for local government in taking its share of the cuts in any revenue support grant. So just how is this amendment going to assist in the vital long-term reshaping and transformation of our services is a mystery to me. This process of transformation needs careful, innovative management, and this amendment does nothing to recognise that. And, Mr Chairman, while this amendment does not refer to the area of public protection, it too has its job of transforming and modernising its services. I'm proud to be the Assistant Cabinet Member for Public Protection, and I'm proud that we now have the opportunity, as an administration, to continue the important work uh, before us. Let's get on with it. Thank you. Councillor Field. Thank you. Makes a change, doesn't it? Um, just to, to be clear, we are talking about the amendment, aren't we? Not the budget itself. Right. In case I too get confused. Um, Basically, uh, as one of the smaller parties here, our, our choice is obviously to support or not to support this amendment. So we've looked at its basics. We look at the reserves. We do believe the analysis of the steady rise in reserves is correct. While there are many items in reserves are necessary to smooth operational expenditure or to allocate money to known future expenditure, there appear to be a significant number of reserves allocated to things that will never happen or that are being funded from current revenue budgets. In a time of austerity, we believe the county should make use of the money available to it to spend in the local economy while the recovery takes hold. We should not have been building reserves through the depths of austerity. Neither should we be seeking to a sufficient buffer to cover the many lean years to come. Reserves, in our view, can cover a rainy day, but not a rainy decade. We then look at the new spend and the restoration of cuts that are proposed. We find we agree with the proposed new spend on school pyramids, although we would actually support a somewhat different model, but, but in principle it's necessary to spend on schools. We find the proposal on discretionary travel necessary and protection of welfare rights and disability advice a service, to move more likely, uh, a service move more likely to benefit the wider spend within the county. Cutting of voluntary sector grants where high value services at minimal cost are provided to those who appear in, appears a, a, a foolish move and one that ultimately costs far more than the 100k saved. However, the, the axe must fall somewhere, and a blanket restoration of all these reductions is not an approach we'd wish to sign up for. 
the total reduction of all new approaches to service delivery appears wrong. But clearly, make-believe changes masking cuts that are not what we would support. Unfortunately, a clear presentation of proposed changes is rarely available to us, on which we could base a clear decision. So we've made a top level of analysis of the proposals and we find we support 8.8 .8 million of the overall 11.9 million proposals. Therefore, taking all into account, we today will vote for the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Field. Councillor Colin Spence, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd just like to, to make a contribution to this debate. Of course, public protection has not been touched by the amendment from uh, members opposite, uh, but I, I think we are talking about the budget and the amendment at the moment. I don't think we've been told... We have not been told that we do not talk about the, both of them. And I will have no opportunity really other than to speak now. I will link it to the amendment because there have been comments made about we are hitting the vulnerable. Public protection and the services that public protection provides works with some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Um, so I, I would like to point that out, and I would like to just point out that actually um, I'd like to thank Councillor Antio for uh, the, the comments that she has made and her officers have worked with her. In terms of public protection, the environment remains a challenging one. In pure numbers, we're a very small part of a wider county council. But I'd like to think we punch above our weight in terms of the value we provide and we will continue to provide to the most vulnerable people in our communities. And they include people who ha have to go through the pain of domestic violence and abuse, gang and youth violence, which is a serious and worrying issue, sexual exploitation, discrimination and hate crime, and the trading standards affect of doorstep selling, putting pressure on older people in our communities, and actually uh, the scams which are growing by the day. They are the services that we provide to the very vulnerable people in our county. In both trading standards and community safety, we will still be providing good support to local communities and businesses both our own, um, on our own and in collaboration with partners. As evidence of this, councillors will, I'm sure, be familiar with the regular sight in their inboxes of media releases that tell the story of another rogue trader who has been brought to book by our trading standards officers and dealt with through the courts. Both trading standards and community safety will see further funding reductions in this budget. But I can assure the council that these have been very carefully managed to ensure they are applied in a way that minimises the impact on frontline services. The largest part of my portfolio is, of course, our fire and rescue service. The extent of government funding for the small number of county council fire services is now more transparent than it has been in previous years. But what this transparency has shown is that funding for all fire services across the country including ours, is reducing, and everything suggests this trend will continue for several years to come. But despite that, we have, in public protection, worked very hard, already addressing some of the need for the changes in transformation. A few years ago, we had a very strong debate in this chamber about combining our fire control with Cambridgeshire. It has proved to be extremely successful, and it's also proved to save this council a huge sum of money, about £400,000 a year. We have changed the whole time fire, firefighter shift system. We have reduced the size of the Suffolk Fire and Rescue fleet of appliances. We have increased the ratio of part-time and on-call uh, staff to full-time firefighters. And we have reduced the senior and middle management team and associated back office support. We have done all of that, and yet we continue to deliver what a lot of people do say to me and to others, a first-class first class public protection service and fire service. I continue to lobby the government and the fire minister to ensure that particular circumstances of our fire and rescue service are recognised. We are a small, rural, largely part-time and well-regarded fire service. 
but we do continue to be amongst the most cost-effective fire services in the country, and this presents particular challenges. Turning to the coming year, I'm pleased that together with offices I've been able to manage the funding reduction without any direct impact on the fire station based 999 emergency response side of a service. Savings have been drawn from further managerial changes, back office rationalisation and reductions to the protection and prevention side of a service. And on one final point, Mr Chairman, in the budget it is noted that we were successful in getting a £4.94 million grant from the Government to help us establish more shared fire police and ambulance stations to support our blue light services. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Spence. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bryony Rudkin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the one service that my family have used most consistently, Suffolk County Council Service, consistently in the 17 years since I've been elected is, of course, the education service. My youngest child is about to leave school this year and his older brothers are at university. They've had good teaching. They're bright boys. Uh, I suspect they would have done well uh, in, in many different settings. None of them wants to be a politician, you'll be glad to hear. One of them is a lawyer, though, so be careful. Um, getting children ready for school is perhaps the most important thing that we can do. Uh, my youngest, my oldest son, when he was young, went to uh, an inner city nursery in, uh, in London where I was working at the time, and it gave him an incredible start. And in fact, he went to a, a nursery off the, off, uh, in the Marquis estate in the middle of Islington that was, in fact, one of the places where some of the stuff that Shaw Start went on to develop was trialled. And he benefited from that in a way that he and the, the other children behind the door, you had no idea the income or the, or the social background or demographics of the families from which they came. But once they were in that nursery, they were being made ready for school. And, and he is now a successful student. And I look back at that as being his first experience of education and how important he was. He was very lucky after that that when we came to Ipswich, he went to a school that had a nursery, a purpose-built nursery that was one of the very first in fact, first or last nurseries that had been introduced by the, the last Labour governments in, in the 1970s. And that was an incredible experience for him and for his brothers. I cannot stress more highly how important it is to have that school readiness ready and to invest in those children's centre services and provision that we've talked about. Now, yesterday we had a, a scrutiny call in, which was very interesting. And uh, I won't go over that because it's probably a little bit painful for some in this room, but. but we live to fight another day on that. Because actually, Councillor Antel, I was very impressed at the Cabinet meeting that I attended prior to that, where some of you and your colleagues were honest enough to say that it was about the finances. I have no problem with that, because that's something that I can argue back to you about, and I can tell you why I think it's worth investing in. It's when the suggestion... Uh, that we should cut children's services and children's centres in Suffolk is dressed up with some academic stuff, some academic stuff. And I, and, I, and I cannot stress more highly that the need for long-standing, understood, peer-reviewed research in order to base such a decision to close is one thing. Saving money is another. And I think it would be far more honest if you talked about that and that we could argue about that rather than giving us some sort of, uh, you know, frankly, academic hyperbole that does not work because actually getting children ready for school is the important thing. Uh, Councillor Bond, if I might just say, you, you seem to have an attack of what my sons would call brain freeze. You know when you eat a really, really cold ice cream and your head goes fizzy? Uh, they still talk about that. I feel you've perhaps had too many of those ice creams because it's been a very long time since I heard such misogyny in this chamber which does nobody a service, not least your incredibly able uh, uh, woman portfolio holder. And, and I actually think that's a shameful thing to say. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, sorry, I had to do this. Do you know that the, the famous There Is No Such Thing As Society was in a quote of an interview to Woman's Own magazine, of all things, must have been read by many Suffolk housewives at the time. Um, and, you know, she said many things. She said there was no such thing as society, and it didn't stop David Cameron trying to reinvent it a few years ago, uh, with the big society. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that will be on anybody's leaflets uh, this time round, but we'll see. Um, I commend this amendment, not least because it actually puts back children's services, early year services, right at the heart of the provision of this council and what we should be providing for everybody in Suffolk. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Julian Flood. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg your pardon. I rather jumped the gun there. I'll support the amendment, more as a protest than I think that they've made their case entirely. Um, yes, you can spend a little bit of the reserves, but you have to address the fact that this is going to go on and on and on. The central government grant was forecast to go down from £20,000 million pounds a year, 2008, to £8,000 million pounds a year in 2020. That's the scale we're talking about. It's mammoth. And small adjustments, little raids on our savings are not going to actually give us the result we need. Now, if we accept the amendment, which I suggest we should, let's spend the year on working hard at changing things. I've, I know that Councillor Antill and her staff have worked hard at cutting here and cutting there, but we need to think of different things to do and bigger things. I, mean, uh, I remember walking around a street in Brandon trying to explain to a resident why her side of the street, the trees and the bushy growth around the bottom had not been trimmed, while across the street, on the other side of the street, ten yards away, the county had cut all those trees. And the reason was this belonged to the borough, that belonged to the county. This is not sensible. The division between borough and county must be addressed. It is a foolish waste of money. It's a big one. It's a big saving. Lots of money. Spend the next year that you gain from raiding the accounts for 12 million and use it to look at things like that. While I'm here, may I actually suggest something which is really dear to my heart? Press the government to tax wind turbines. A wind turbine that makes a thousand a hundred thousand pounds a year in subsidy alone pays the same rate as a small news agent on Haverhill High Street. It's not good enough. Let's get some extra money from the renewables. The government will have to do it. You're in a position to influence them. Go for it. The Conservative group can't go on like this because you're losing people. You are losing people. You're losing the hearts and minds of people and you're losing your own people on the benches behind you. I am, I am not a natural politician. I got into this because I... <laughs> I got into this because I found myself shouting at the television. And I was shouting, we can't go on like this. And that actually is the case. We can't go on like this. Let me explain, let me urge the Conservative group to say to central government, we are being pushed too far. We are cutting services that matter to the old, the sick, and the weak. We can't go on like this. Please stop doing it. Thank you, Councillor Flood. Councillor Bowl, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, You'll have to excuse me a little bit, only because I'm a little bit jet-lagged. Um, but I thought it was important enough to be here because I thought about the, uh, the debate that has been going on so far. And one of the things that needs to be said is that I'm glad that the equality impact assessments on the budget is going to be done during 2015-16, though it's a little bit late after the budget is set. We will be interested to see what the assessment 
is, for instance, on the cuts to voluntary sector organizations. But the clearest, discri the clearest discrimination of these budget cuts is against people who have less financial resources. We talk about not cutting council not raising council tax, but the people who are the most vulnerable don't pay it because they have to get the benefits. And your cuts to the welfare advice services and to the welfare payments themselves must be some of the most short-sighted and counterproductive cuts in this budget. Not only are you destroying people's lives by pre preventing them from getting the help and advice they need to wade through the morass that is the welfare system, a system which I have the experience to have gone through myself and having some knowledge of welfare issues and welfare policies, I'm able to make my way through. Unfortunately, some of my constituents cannot do this, and they rely on the advice centers, particularly the CAB and the Disabled Advice Bureau, without which these people would not be able to access help because they cannot work, and they need the help to survive. But if you're storing up extra costs for yourselves by allowing them to become homeless, and thus usually, usually also unemployed and stressed and unwell, we want people to be able to stand on their own feet. But if you don't give them the first hand up to start with, you doom them to a life of hopelessness and fear. Even the present government has relented on the social welfare fund, and yet this council is not even passporting that money to the people who need it, but using it as an excuse to put the underspend on the current social welfare budget into the ever-increasing general reserves. Now, I know people will probably groan about that, but I wanted to add one other thing about the Children's Center because I have the third most um, highly benefit-using constituency in Suffolk. And I'd like to invite the counselors across the way to take a walk with those parents from the local Children's Center and make the walk to an overcrowded children's center that has no hope to be able to handle the needs of those people. And then go back and face them at election time or any other time when they ask, when are we going to get another children's center because we can't use the services that are available? I'm sorry, the rent is too high. But Unfortunately, it needs to be there because they're there. So I would beg my colleagues across the way to think of that. So please think about those people who are not going to care one way or another about council tax, whether it's raised or, or not. But think about the fact that they're not going to get their needs met, and we're going to have a storm of people waiting in line for additional help that isn't available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Gaylord, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm speaking in support of the amendment. Firstly, the cuts to adult care voluntary sector grants, uh, 0.1 million savings, should be reversed. Apparently, supporting lives connected to communities is about new ways of working for ACS in Suffolk. Um, Councillor Antlow uh, said earlier that uh, the, one of the aims of Suffolk County Council is to give support for people and communities so that they can support themselves. 
and there will be a new level of partnership with our communities. Um, so we're working to help people live independent lives by building on local community support that's available to them and working to build community capacity. What do these fine words mean in reality? Cutting adult care voluntary sector grants to six volunteer centres and four support organisations, the Bangladeshi Support Centre, the Chinese Family Welfare Centre, the Alzheimer's Society and Age UK Suffolk. Do these cuts increase community <coughs> capacity? No. Do these cuts enable the community to meet its own needs? No. The very thing that you need to support, you are cutting. Right, secondly, the cuts to culture, heritage and sports services, one, uh, point 0.1 million, these should be reversed. <coughs> On every count, the small financial investment the county council makes uh, in culture and arts, it gets back 20 times the amount these organisations lever into the county 20 times more money than we are actually investing in them. Why would you put this in jeopardy? It seems like a sensible return to me if you have to look at it in purely financial terms. These cuts run the risk of irretrievably damaging the long-term viability of these organisations. It is a disgrace that the council takes such a view. This county boasts a rich heritage and culture. By proposing these cuts, this administration shows it has a short-sighted view of the impact that culture and heritage has on education, well-being, innovation, jobs, economic development and tourism in the county. Thirdly, there's just one more thing I want to talk about, which is libraries. Last year, £70,000 was cut from the Bookstock Fund. This year, we're cutting another £120,000 from the library service. The library service is a really important part, as you all know and you all go on about, how they're vital to our communities. And you're cutting it. The Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals warn that libraries are often viewed as easy targets to save money. This is short-sighted and dangerous. Public library services offer people access to the information, tools and support needed to survive and thrive in today's society. Exactly what you're actually saying you're wanting them to do. People use public libraries to look for employment, to ac access essential government services and develop their skills. Phil Bradley, SILIP president, ex-president, says it's not an over-exaggeration to say that the more that library services are cut, the more people will cut, be cut adrift from access to basic information that they so desperately need. An attack on the library service is an attack on the community and for everyone in society, young and old, male or female, literate or not, with internet access or without, it is vital that they are not only kept running but that they, they flourish. I support this amendment. Thank you very much, Councillor Mrs Gage. Am I the only missus in the room? <laughs> okay. You know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, speak to the transport element. You won't be surprised to hear of our budget amendment. Um, last June, this council decided to reduce the cost of home to school travel. Not for low income families, no for the County Council to squirrel away £65,000 this year and £375,000 next year. 
charging low-income families £540 per year per child for a seat on a bus is likely to price some children out of an education. If this council is serious about raising the bar, putting financial barriers in the way of children getting to school is clearly irresponsible. We know that low education attainment is proportionally high in areas of deprivation. So why should low-income families be required to find the bulk of cash savings on school travel for this council? This charge alone is likely to limit the opportunities for young people from low-income families to achieve their full potential. We therefore propose £300,000 to remove this charge funded from the £9.4 million travel contingency reserve. And I'd like to go on to mention home to school or training travel for post 16 year olds. This council has a responsibility to tackle the number of or potential risk of our young people becoming NEETs. What is a certainty is that young people are more likely to drop out of learning or training if they do not have access to public transport or if it is financially prohibitive. So we believe this council needs to address the impact the cost of transport can have on young people from low-income families. Investing one million specifically for post-16-year-olds from disadvantaged families is not a reckless spend, but a responsible long-term saving proposal. And lastly, year on year there is an underspend on the on-street parking account. 0.7 million in this year's and previous years has resulted in a reserve of 1.8 million. At July last year's Cabinet, we saw an allocation of £690,000 to various county wide projects, with only 120,000 of that sum allocated to Bury St Edmunds and to Ipswich. This account is accrued entirely in Ipswich and Bury St Edmunds and only in those two towns. And we believe it should be spent in these towns with the addition of Lowestoft, not Graham, spread thinly and ineffectively like butter across the county. Especially as year on year we have seen an underspend in the capital market town's budget. In 2014-15 budget review we were told it is anticipated that 6.3 million will be carried forward into 2015-16. Now I'm sure this is great news for our market towns and I'm sure they'll appreciate that money being set aside for them. And I'm also equally sure that Councillor Newman is even now preparing to remind me that in Ipswich we have 21 million being rather slowly spent on travel Ipswich. Um, and, and that Lowestoft also has its own travel Ipswich experience. But travel Ipswich is about managing traffic on the main arterial routes. It does not address the transport problems in the rest of the town. What Ipswich, Lowestoft and indeed Bury St Edmunds need is their own capital town's budget. Allocating £1.5 million from the on-street parking account surplus will enable the suburbs of each town where the traffic, in traffic is issues in those suburbs are individually on a par with our market towns to benefit from capital investment. Can I remind you, easing congestion on the school run on the residential bus routes, increasing the opportunities and the sense of safety to cycle and walk are essential to meet this Council's health, healthier lifestyle aims. And where can we achieve those? Well, in the greatest aims can clearly, the greatest gains can clearly be achieved in our three largest towns with a sensible programme of investment. I fully support the amendment to the budget and obviously the, the travel and highway elements within this. And I would recommend that the re rest of the council do likewise. Thank you. Councillor Noble. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, I, I've heard some speeches in my day, but I, I have never heard Councillor Martin have such a misunderstanding of what it's like to live outside Ipswich. He paints a picture of everybody driving their children to their private schools. Well, I'm sorry, Councillor Martin, rural poverty is just as real as urban poverty. The community I represent 
is, by any definition, hard press. Now, when I first got involved in this council, I got involved in this council because you put the council tax up 11.9 and then 18.5 per cent. The people in my community came to me and said, what am I going to do about this? I have to pay this bill. And nobody's putting my salary up 11.9 and 18.5 per cent. And I got involved in this place. And I got involved to make this council live within its means. You went on to say that this budget is about spending the money and how we spend it. And in there, it's quite clear in your amendment that this reserve just, it just burns a hole in your pocket. And you just see it as money and it's just there and we, we should spend it. And off we go. And then you went on to give an articulation around to try and head off that comment about us actually timesing it by how many years we think austerity will continue before we actually see some release in the capital grant. And you said that if we times that by five years, we simply arrive at the reserve in 2010. And you are correct, because the reserve that we put in place in February 2010 was before we truly learnt the scale of the financial fiasco that your party instigated on this country. With that infamous note from Liam Burns, there is no money. And what we know now is instead of a period from 2000 to 2010 when there was base grant increases, and you still put the council tax up 11.9 and 18.5%, in that time, since then, we are going through a period of austerity. This country is having to learn to live within its means. It can no longer print money. You then went on to rant about subprime mortgages in America. I remind you that before 2007, you were still running this country at a £70 billion a year deficit. And it rose as you exited to £160 billion, and now this government is getting it under control. So it is 2020. Well, the deficit this year is going to be 100 million. That's getting it under control. And by 2020, we will have a situation where hopefully there is base grant coming back. Now, let's turn to the budget book and let's look at what that budget says. And, Councillor Gaynor, you, you said about libraries. I think you need to read some of what's going on here. You need to read some of supporting lives and connecting communities. You need to see what is going on because every library still happens to be open. Every library is still delivering the very services that you value. And when you look at supporting lives and connecting communities, it is about taking the money that we have, about this council living within its means and actually delivering services with and in our communities for the most vulnerable in our community. This is real money when we talk about zero, you know. This year, if you actually applied the cap, that's the equivalent of £142 more on a band D property. By 2017-18, that will be £205 more. In my community... That is the difference for many of the hard-pressed families about being able to balance their budgets and not being able to balance their budgets. You have talked incessantly, your party talks about the cost of living, and yet we know from past experience of 11.9 and 18.5%, we know even now across the road you're putting up the council rent, that is hollow. This budget is deliverable. It protects the most vulnerable in our communities because it is sustainable and that is why I commend it to this council.